Hi, everybody. Today's February 5th, uh, 2024, and I'm honored to have with me uh, five times August, uh, Brad Schistemus, and um, he's a great songwriter. I love his stuff. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at five times August, and you can find him right here, uh, right now. So, Brad, tell us what's uh, new in your world. Oh, geez, what's new in my world? Um, I'm just doing what I do every day, really. I, you know, I'm, I'm balancing... Um, being a dad, raising my kids, um, keep making sure they're growing up to be leaders, getting them an education. I'm worried about all the things that parents, I think, on, on our side of the aisle is worried about, trying to make sure they're ready to tackle this world that's being created around us. And, um, you know, the other side of that is continuing speaking out through my art and writing, recording, uh, putting out music and videos and, uh, got my hands in, in a number of projects right now. And that's what I'm I'm up to every day. So just to clarify for people, uh, you, your art is music. Mm -hmm. um, and your music theme, I mean, you, you, you were probably doing music before you were doing, say, what might be termed political music. Um, you know, I think the left glorifies, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and a lot of the anti-Vietnam War uh, music of the 60s and so forth and uh you know fight the man revolution mm -hmm. so forth now who are the genuine uh say music revolutionaries now and uh, what happens to them um i think that the music revolutionaries right now are a lot of indie guys like myself um i've been i mean five times august started in 2001 i was right out of high school and so i spent you know a good the first 10 years of my career were playing coffee shops and and then getting I was, I was touring universities and um i had a lot of song placements on on mtv shows and movies and commercials and stuff and um by the time i was meeting with major record labels i didn't really want to sign with them anyway um just because the the industry was changing and i was doing so much on my own and so i think that that paved the way for me to be the artist that i am now because i don't have any any ties to any 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 kind of management or lawyers trying to guide my image and look and my message it's just me and that i see across the board with the artists that are speaking out right now i think we've got a, a great new crop of of, of uh, outspoken artists who they're just uh they're free from any kind of chains to the industry we've got i mean first guys that come to mind right now are, are really close friends of mine. There's Joseph Arthur, who's been uh, a, a great singer songwriter. He's been around the last 20 years. Uh, the Defiant is a brand new band of, of guys that got kicked out of their bands, very popular bands like The Offspring and Smash Mouth and um, the Mighty Mighty Boston's. They've teamed up now to form a band called The Defiant. And they're, they're um, starting to get out there now. They've just released a record and um, you know, there's it, it's a lot of different genres too um which is exciting to see so you know out of out of those revolutionaries from the 60s we all know we sort of got eric clapton and van morrison and that was it they were the only ones who really come out of the 60s and 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 still speak up and um when it mattered and everybody else is sort of just fallen away they either they either didn't speak up at all or they made commercials for pfizer and um, or posted a picture of them getting their shot back in 2021 and, and did that campaign. So so the truth has revealed itself at this point about the state of rock and roll, who our heroes are, and, and there's a lot changing right now. And it's been interesting being on the outside of that um, in, in early 2021 when I started speaking out this way and, and getting more political with my message, which I wasn't used to doing at all. I just felt a need to do it and, and use my platform in that way. Um, it's interesting to see, to go from there being on the outside and really feeling the pushback and losing fans and, and seeing the anger and resentment and being called names and labeled, being ostracized from, from industry friends to coming into 2024 and now it being more accepted and people are starting, you know, when I post online now and say the same things I was saying back in 2021, um, 
it, it has a different response now. And I think people are waking up to that. And there's a cultural movement that's happening. And it's from from the indie guys. It's not going to be anybody from the mainstream. It's all it's all these indie guys, which is really exciting to see because because you're you're seeing the change and the shift happen. And that's where we're at right now. So the um, for, for purposeless reasons, I think the um, COVID vaccine was mostly pushed as an mRNA platform. Uh, we had had the uh, flu shot modality, basically an adenovirus uh, formation uh, for flu shots, and they're reasonably safe over the years. Um, they're actually because of at the time of Zika, which is my specialty, uh, Bill Gates tried to push the mRNA platform for a putative uh, Zika vaccine, uh, which never got produced. But this concept of having the mRNA vaccine out there um, was always, I'm, I'm actually coming to a point here, um, was always uh, kind of this, this thing that they wanted to have this new mRNA platform, which, you know, kind of goes right to the heart of, um, you know, of our genome. And I, I don't think it necessarily alters our genome per se, but it has the danger and risk of, of transmitting, you know, genetic information um, quite, you know, quickly throughout the body uh, itself. Now, I, I'm actually... I don't really want to talk about the vaccine per se, aside from the kind of civil rights aspect to it. But, you know, the analogy I was going to make is that um, we actually have kind of mRNA uh, in societally, and that's messaging. Um, so the, actually, the funny thing is message, mRNA stands for messenger RNA, and it's a little snip of, of genetic information that passes around and, you know, can act upon our cells and our body as well. But in the body politic, just to make the, the, the whole the analogy here, and I'm, I'm trying this out for the first time, so I apologize, just thought of it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think that the, 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 the thoughts are the mRNA of our society. And, and those can either get captured and, uh, you know, shunted or whatever. But, but, you know, some people will allow certain messages to kind of flow through the system very passively. And, and, um, you know, how, how, does, how does the body politic, how does our society as a whole maintain its health if the messaging is, is kind of controlled and forced in a certain way? And, and you present as your own messaging um, a, a different prospect. And, and, and how do people make this kind of choice, which, you know, oftentimes they can't necessarily be informed of? Uh, tell me, A, how horrible was my analogy? And B, whether it made any sense at all? And C, um, whether uh, there's any kind of resonance uh, or uh, of that for you. Mm -hmm. No, I follow the analogy. It's good. I see where you're going with it. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's a different, my job is not to, cause I have this argument all the time with like, you know, there's, there's the COVID COVID cultist troll doctors on Twitter and they're always trying to antagonize and, and, and get me into some sort of debate. And I'm like, my job as an artist is not to debate you you go debate another doctor or scientist or something that that's where you're supposed to be instead they're coming which really shows you how um how terrible how how, how diminished their career is that they're coming after a songwriter my job is to make you think my message is to get you to think outside the box i'm supposed to as an artist hold the mirror back up onto these times and get you to think in a way that you you haven't thought before or to express something that people may not be able to find the words for themselves and that is an emotional response and that's something that data and statistics and graphs can't really do you know we can argue which doctor said what and which graph came from what organization and um, all that but people the average person is seeing something happen around them that they know is off. And my job is to, to give them a tool that they can resonate with, that they can share and show others um, that may wake them, wake up somebody else who hasn't thought that way, who maybe leans into um, uh, traditional avenues like mainstream news or, you know, wherever they're there, what, what they consider to be a reliable source. And, and so my job is to give them something that makes them go, Oh, I, I didn't really think about it that way. It's much more simpler when you look at it that way, or, or in my videos, sometimes I'll take, you know, a lot of clips and, and put them in one place because mm -hmm. we, we see 
these things in pieces around the internet or on the news, but when you when you put them in one package um, and see them all, you really see what's happened in a, in a way that you can't you can't that that you're not going to get from just a line going up on a graph or a line going down. And so that's I think how that message you know gets through. And um, it is also interesting though because my my music and my my videos they don't necessarily give you any medical advice but there are still gatekeepers you know trying to to keep that message from getting mm -hmm. to people on you know online who will censor the videos or pull them down or flag them as dangerous and um call them medical mis misinformation and that's a whole other can of worms in and of itself because now art is being censored online it's not just certain doctors and it's not you know just certain information it's art that's being interpreted for the people and if somebody on the other end of youtube says oh well this music video is dangerous i perceive it to be medical misinformation i'm going to make sure it doesn't get seen as much i'm going to suppress it or flag it or demonetize it um you know that's a dangerous world to be in and and it's it's a slippery slope to be a part of and so we have to continue to fight that i don't know if i answered your question no that, that's fair <laughs> enough. so, so I, I could go two different ways here but um just for the audience that's not necessarily familiar with your stuff first of all they're easy you're easy to find at at sign five times august on on x uh and you're on youtube i think for, as the same um you're talking about getting monetized uh, where where does your m money flow from or which which modalities you say or you, you may not want to reveal that um but what what are the top songs and messages that you've had that that people have um you know kind of been able to match their own emotions with well i think i have sort of two avenues that um well i can't just say two but you know one specific avenue that reven resonates with people i think right now is when i call out somebody specifically now, I've got a song that calls out Joe Biden called Joe. I have a song called Sad Little Man that's directed straight at Anthony Fauci. I have a song called This Just In that calls out Justin Trudeau. Um, and my latest song, Ain't No Rock and Roll, calls out the entire music industry and, and, and all the all the rock and rollers that that aren't speaking up and speaking out against the man. And And I think that stuff resonates with people because it's something that we're all thinking, you know. I, you know, mo I don't think most people, most people don't like Joe Biden. So when they see somebody actually call him out, um, it resonates in that way. And um, because you don't see it very much, there's, there's a hunger for it. There's a, there's a whole other side that's been so suppressed that when it finally bubbles up, you see this, this uh, um, incredible thing happen. Like, um, like Tom McDonald, a rap an independent rap artist who's dominating uh youtube and uh billboard charts lately he just released a song with um ben shapiro and he's doing these things that um there's a there's a little hunger for with people on our side of the aisle because it gets so suppressed that mm -hmm. if you have a platform like his and you say these you know, he's got millions of followers now. He's actually competing with the mainstream. He's topping the charts on iTunes and Amazon. And and um, that speaks volumes about what's happening and the true state of, of where people are at. Um, that when, when an indie artist with no label can do that and compete with, um, you know, these artists that have millions behind them and a whole machine behind them. Um, it tells you where the state of things are and um and that's that's cool to see i kind of just lost my train of thought um but um yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> the the um thomas donald what what is what is his general message that he's putting out and I, i'm not familiar with him so you know he has uh he's got, he, he was starting to say things through his music before I started speaking out. In fact, he was one of the artists that I saw um, saying things online in a time where you started to think, oh, you know, you can still say that online. But, um, you know, he's just calling it like it is. Um, it's hard to describe, you know, what his specific message is, but I think he really celebrates 
freedom of speech to the maximum potential through his songs. And he gets a lot of people that don't listen to rap enjoying his music because he crossbreeds his message with, he did a song with the country artist, John Rich, mm -hmm. um, him teaming up with Ben Shapiro and making Ben Shapiro rap in his song after Ben oh, Shapiro, I I, you know, I did see a little yeah. Bit. And, and so he, he has the ability to create these viral moments that cross over, you know, that get mm -hmm. talked about. And that's the power of, uh, of art and culture that I don't think, you know, independents and conservatives have really maximized yet. They, they're still, you know, that the, if the left does something crazy on their side, they can sing songs about, you know, uh, they can make soft core porn video, music videos and not get flagged. They can, you know, celebrate drugs. They can celebrate, um, you name it, you know, they, any any sort of Satan, they can dance, they can lap dance with Satan in their music video. You know, we've all seen those videos. Um, and then we all talk about it. Right. And, and then it gives them more publicity. And there's that's the shift that I'm starting to talk about with our side of the aisle is that we're now creating art that's getting talked about by them. And so, like when Tom McDonald releases a video with Ben Shapiro, now the other side's talking about what we're doing. And that's how the shift happens because the focus is on what we're doing and and now we've triggered them and and that's fun to see and that's kind of i you know that's fun to be a part of mm -hmm. now um i think last time we spoke uh, first the first time we spoke it was about the time when that uh song uh, I, what's his name uh you know the red-haired guy um near uh, north carolina virginia with the um, oh yeah right 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 he's got two um, different names. he's got his stage name and his real name um mm -hmm. maybe you can help me out here what what's happened is his, is his name uh something anthony um yeah oliver anthony that's right thank you yeah. i was gonna say cole anthony but he's a basketball player <laughs> but i knew it was something anthony and um and that, that that's actually not his name uh which is something else i don't remember mm -hmm. um but he's kind of was there and I, I haven't heard much from him um what, what is that phenomenon like and how much pushback is there? And, you know, do they try, try to put kind of the genie back in the bottle um, amongst the, you know, music industry? Did he get, did he get a contract? You know, if it, if he had come out of like um, America's got talent, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Kelly Clarkson or something like that, he'd have, he'd have a, a, a contract, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's interesting to see that stuff. I mean, that's, that's uh, the unpredictable landscape of the internet right it's like you can be nobody yesterday and then tomorrow you wake up and everybody knows your songs and um you know that's again it shows you the reality of you know what people desire when when he he had something that resonated with so many that it, it took hold and created a phenomenon in, in less than 24 hours. I mean, I saw his video and I, I said, hey, check this guy out, uh, support what he's doing. And, you know, next time he did a show, it was a packed house and, and he's doing his thing now. And I don't know who, you know, yeah, uh, back in the day, if somebody had accomplished that, you know, if you go back 10, 15 years or so, maybe around MySpace days or something like that, you would have had major labels clamoring for that guy because there's money to be made. Um, I know that he was presented with a lot of different opportunities and deals shortly after. I don't know by who, but he's he's clearly chosen to stay independent. And I think he sees the value and the freedom uh, of retaining what he wants to say over the dollar. And that's also an aspect of, of the artist that is changing things right now from our side is we've all chosen integrity over the check and over the contract and you know i've invested zero dollars in promoting the music that i've put out over the last you know several years these these political songs they've all done what they've done by word of mouth and hmm. just you know pushing it out just just sending it to people and that's an awesome thing to know you know it means that you know whatever this music accomplishes it's it's doing what it's doing because it really resonates with people. And so, you know, I don't know what it's like to, to go from zero to 100 overnight like that. Um, you know, I have certain videos that that take hold and then, you know, people talk about them. 
and I've had that to varying degrees, not to his degree is what I'm saying, um, because I've definitely had different little viral spikes and peaks. I think every time it, that happens now, the the funny thing is on, you know, instead of instead of labels rushing to offer you a contract, you're having the internet suppress you and try to prevent you uh, from reaching more people. That's what happened with my song, Sad Little Man, was Glenn Beck shared it and then it, it spiked immediately and YouTube started hiding it from their search results instead of, you know, letting people find it. Um, but uh, yeah, with, with uh, Oliver Anthony, um, you know, to, to go from that to, to another height, uh, it really tells you there's a hunger for that message and, and it's resonating people. It's time, you know, it's time for things to change. Yeah, I I didn't see him on the Grammys. Uh, first of all, first of all, it exactly, it's been, <laughs> been hard for me because I don't watch the Grammys, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, but I watched some of the the periphery, you know, the foo for all, uh, the <clears throat> Talking Heads, whatever. Um, you know, my wife uh, will skim through that stuff, and mm -hmm. um, she doesn't watch it either. But you know, we we are aware that Miley Cyrus won something, and last year, I, I, you know, I I think it was WAP uh, won some stuff. Um, at the same time that baby it's cold outside was being lambasted for uh it's supposed uh, sexual aggression quasi date rape concept of of staying indoors because it was cold outside and, you know giving mm -hmm. her a drink whatever um you know the, 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 there was a comedian who, who went through the lyrics of, of baby it's cold outside versus mm -hmm. the wap which i'm not even yeah. gonna touch those lyrics yeah and frankly are there a good number of songs you know i would say most every rap song has that certain a magical word that, that nobody can say besides the people in the rap song. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of like this weird double standard. Th things get promoted um, uh, from within and the, the Grammys, I, I believe they, I, you know, you mentioned the satanic dance. Um, uh, was that uh, Smith or something like that? Um, Sam Smith. Sam Smith. I, I'm good with last names. I can't do the first name. <laughs> um, but I, I think that was, a, I don't know if that was a Grammys. I think, uh, you know, what, what kind of show is that? Uh, would you have your kids watch the Grammys? And A and B, did you um, see uh, what comes away from that? What what who are the Grammy uh, voters or, or whatever? Um, mm -hmm. Is it does it have any relevance societally, or is it just kind of a, a circular uh, um, self congratulation crowd? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wouldn't let my kids watch it. I don't watch it. Um, you know, I, I I I've always been on the outskirts of the mainstream music world i know people in it i've i've come very close to to being in those circles through contracts and stuff but i always was over here just enough to observe it from the outside and i know grammy winners i've worked with grammy winners i i am a grammy or i was a grammy voting member and and that was a funny thing was by the time I became a Grammy voting member. I did not care about it at all anymore. It wasn't cool to me. And I, I made a post about it last year when Pfizer sponsored the Grammys it was just that, you know, there's no way I would be able to consciously celebrate, you know, being at the, if, if I was at the Grammys and, and Pfizer was sponsoring it, knowing all the damage that's been done. But, um, you know, that all that stuff is just an illusion. People don't really understand how the industry works, how award shows work, those things don't really interest. They, they did interest me at one point, but then once you really, that's why I always have butted up against it and observed the industry from that mainstream industry from the outskirts. But like every time you sort of cross the line and dip your toe into it or work with somebody from that world, I, I've always walked away from it with a bad taste in my mouth going like, that is just, you know, it, it's 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 a messed up world and and um and it's very political you know there's obviously a, a lot of, of bias that goes on the the voting the way the voting works and everything there's a lot of money there's a lot of you know handshakes and, and things like that it's all an illusion and it doesn't really mean anything it's a bunch of people getting in a room thinking they're you know these great godlike figures to society because that's how we treated them for mm -hmm. the last you know 60 years in pop culture is you know oh that 
you know, they put that song out and it's number one and everybody knows it and they're amazing. So you can't touch them. And we, we, we cultivated this culture where we created these, uh, you know, false gods for ourselves and, and they're still living that life. They don't, they're in this echo chamber of self-congratulatory, um, you know, uh, just, just patting themselves on the back all the time. So they get their award, they go up, they make their speech about how they're going to fight for whatever their cause is at the moment. They think the entire world's listening when nobody's watching the Grammys anymore. Nobody's watching award shows because nobody wants to hear it. And then they celebrate themselves and, you know, they put out their next record and, and everything that we see, like when you look at an artist like Taylor Swift, maybe organically in the beginning, there was something there that people could connect with. And, and I see this happen a lot with female artists is it, there's a lot, there's a lot of grooming that happens with the public, with female artists, you know, introduce you to a nice young girl with a clean cut image they'll earn the parents' trust. The parents will buy the music for the kids at an early age. And then, you know, intentional or not, or under the influence from behind the scenes, that girl will be influenced to start exploring her womanhood and her sexuality and her independence. And then she makes this turn where now here she is, she's a woman and she gets, she's wearing a little less clothes now. She's singing about, a lot, a, you know, <laughs> yeah. Pure and, and so that that happens over time. And then because we idolize these figures, we we justify it, right? Oh, well, you know, she was she's such a nice young girl, and then the kids really like her music. And so we'll forgive her this time with with this album, you know. And then the next album is 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 even more risque, and she's saying more, you know, derogatory right. things and, and and whatever it may be. Um and, and that happens with, you know, across the board with artists. And the, that's why we're in the position that we're in. And, and you see this, uh, you know, uh, they know that they can market this, right? That's why when you see Sam Smith uh, celebrating Satan and he's shaking his, his, you know, his fat ass on TV, people are, you know, there's a group of society that, that's like, good, good, yay, you know, I'm going to get that record. And it's dumbed us down to that level. But on the other side of that coin, um, it's so ugly and perverse and gross that there's, you know, people are thirsting for something more pure and honest and real. And, and that's where, you know, guys like us come in. Yeah. It's a funny thing. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I agree. There's kind of this, <clears throat> we'll call it <clears throat> the uh, Miley Cyrus arc, you know, that uh, you, you come in, as a childhood fave, whatever. Um, and then, I mean, I, I think part of it's the Hollywoodization. Uh, part of it's, you know, when you say grooming, I think that obviously that has you know, multiple connotations. You know, how, how much group, grooming was going on, you know, behind the scenes in order to get to that scene. You know, historically, you know, Judy Garland, Wizard of Oz, you know, she was not uh, the, the age that she was, you know, in the, in the, in the you know, Dorothy. Dorothy was supposed to be a young girl. And I think, you know, Garland was, you know, in her early 20s, or something like that. But, you know, she wound up having a miserable, you know, massively alcoholic, you know, wild life per the times and whatever mm -hmm. drugs were around as well. And and her life was misery. And, you know, she described later on, you know, that she was tossed around, you know, from producer to producer. And there's kind of this implicit, you know, Harvey Weinstein um, uh, pact. And, and I think Harvey Weinstein was kind of a monster, but, you know, it, it also takes two to tango. There, there are a lot of stage moms who will put their, their kids in this, you know, meat grinder kind of machine uh, to get something out. You know, I, I, I do think, and I'm not defending Harvey Weinstein, but he probably was reasonably transactional. Um, you know, he was able to produce uh, success for the people who were, you know, willing to produce something else for him. And mm -hmm. there's kind of this, you know, uh, with, with the women artists in particular, I think um, there's this aspect that I think there's, you know, potential, you know, sexual kind of, uh, you know, abuse uh, going beyond, going on behind the scenes. And there's also, you know, whatever, you know, frailties that, that um, you know, women have for their image. And I'm not saying this against women, but women do care more about their appearance. And there's a, a kind of a wider 
range of feelings that they have about themselves than guys do. I think guys tend to be more towards, you know, some median aspect of how they feel about themselves. And, you know, the prototypical, say, Amy Winehouse um, kind of biopic thing, you know, where she, you know, feels great, feels horrible, feels great. You know, they're kind of much more on a swing and then the drugs and get involved, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, but but I think that there's a danger, you know, from Billie Holiday, um, you know, all the way up that, that women, you know, singers, um, you know, kind of have a much more of a high wire act and then they fall off. Um, and it's not to say the guys don't do this as well, but their trajectory is different because guys are guys. Um, I was just reading um, a little piece on Deborah Harry, Blondie, and, you know, I loved her so singing, um, but she has kind of a quasi tragic life. And, you know, there's just, just a, a weird way that, um, you know, kind of your, your youth uh, passes you by uh, as you devote yourself to the music that I don't think guys necessarily have in the same way because guys don't get pregnant. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so, so uh, the nation's favorite topic uh, potentially is uh, Taylor Swift. Um, what, what are your thoughts on her music, her uh, current approach, um, her positioning um, and so forth? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of what you just touched on is is how willing are you to play the game within the industry? And, you know, I was never willing to play that game for what for, you know, whatever it may have cost me is fine, because I see the way that the industry chews up people and, and spits them out. And, you know, you're right. You see that a lot with women artists, especially if you look at Britney Spears and, and how you know, what's happened to her over her life. Everybody loved her and, and welcomed her into culture, you know, when she was young and, and a lot has happened to her behind the scenes that, you know, you look at what she's posting now online and you, you know, you know, she's not okay. And that's a result from the industry. It's not, you know, just her, but, and, and that's what the game does to you. Um, as far as Taylor Swift, I think that, you know, she's talented. I've, I've, uh, she, she puts out catchy music and, and that's great. And there are plenty of worse artists to, you know, introduce your, your kids to, you know, mm -hmm. she's still relatively, you know, pretty clean cut and um, compared to a lot of other uh, artists and, and that's fine. Um, it's, it's interesting watching you know, the thing you have to pay attention to is, is where these people show up. What is it that, what is their messaging? What are they, what are they doing right now? The, her, her relationships are always a gigantic talking point. You know, who's she with right now? What are they doing? Well, she's with, you know, Travis, Travis Kelsey, and he's promoting Pfizer. And, and she's, I think what has happened with her is that when you reach a certain point on your way up, somewhere slides in this other level of the game. You know, you've played the game, you've got your management, your contracts, your image is refined, you're changing your sound from one record to the X, you're an icon, and now everybody knows you and you're a worldwide pop star. But then where do you go from there? And I think you start mingling in with deeper, darker agendas and in the machine behind you gets bigger. And she represents herself as an independent artist. I don't, I don't think it's as independent as she lets on. I think that's all an illusion. Um, that's just my opinion. I couldn't confirm that, but from knowing what I know um, and watching what's happening with media, it's just a matter of, you always have to ask yourself, why are you seeing what you're seeing? That that's, you know, that's what it comes down to. I have this conversation a lot, you know, whether it's entertainment or in the news, no matter what it is that we're all talking about, I always ask myself, why are you seeing what you're seeing? You know, and, and why is she saying what she's saying now? Who is convincing her to, you know, post a picture of her holding all of her Biden cookies that she made whenever she was voting, you know, just telling all of her fans to vote for Biden a few years ago. And she'll do that again, you know, and, and so, you know, I, I don't know. There's, there's, there's game plans that get, get in there. Yeah. She, you know, so. 
I don't well, know. I think, I think I think I think you know people are very much encouraged to say whatever they want politically as long as it's of one side. Yeah, and that's the funny thing about it. You know, I catch a lot of flack for saying what I say online. You know, apparently I'm only in it for the money, right? I'm only in this anti-vax crazy conspiracy theorist movement for the money. But uh, making a Pfizer commercial for twenty million on the other side of that coin is perfectly okay, you know. Um, so it, it's funny to see that, you know, that double standard. Yeah. So I, I just want to maybe clarify one point. I mean, when you say anti-vax, um, I'm a medical doctor and I've given out thousands of vaccines over the years. I have to say, though, that, you know, I started practicing in the 1980s. And in 1986, there was this thing called the NCVIA, which basically gave blanket uh, liability coverage for vaccine makers. Um, after which we've seen a huge ballooning in the number of vaccines, because if a company comes out with a pill, they can potentially be sued for, you know, damages from the pill, but a vaccine, they're completely covered. So a lot of treatment modalities have turned into vaccine, um, forays, uh, because they, it's a, it's a basically a win-win if they can get it into the, you know, if they can get it on the shelves, basically, um, at the public health department and so forth, then it's going to sell and it's going to sell forever. There's not going to be any adjudication and there's no liability. So it's kind of like you may not make the big time, but once you're there, you're, you're pretty much a fixture. And the number of vaccines before the age of 12, I think, has gone up from my ancient days in the 1980s of, you know, say a dozen or so uh, to, I think, 205 or something like that. It's an enormous number. There's, there's a whole panoply of recommended vaccines. And I don't think all of them are quite essential. And some of them, frankly, are somewhat kind of societally regressive. You know, giving uh, uh, girls this, um, um, uh, you know, it's kind of like it, it's basically a promiscuity uh, vaccine. Um, and it's kind of like at a certain age, you're giving it before a uh, sexual um, uh, majority mm -hmm. and so forth. Anyway, the, the you know, number of vaccines has gone up. But that being said, I'm not specifically anti-vax. You know, I'm not against all vaccines. I think the vaccines have done some useful things. We don't see smallpox. We don't see German measles, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, on your own kind of kind of personal front, you have kids and so forth. Um, what is the the, the vaccine? Uh, what's your? I mean, I, so just to, to clarify, I, I do think that the COVID vaccine was a uh, a potential landmine because you know it's put out without any studies really of any you know actual measure. You know, normal vaccine takes five to seven years before it's put out. Obviously, this one wasn't. They've used a totally new modality and they're not willing to hear about any adverse effects and they push it on the whole population. Most of them weren't going to get sick from COVID. So kids, for instance. So I'm against kids getting COVID vaccines, first of all. But I'm not against, say, a 90-year-old having gotten it in 2021. Um, I don't. I think the boosters are idiotic. Um, I don't think they're real boosters. I think COVID-19 is long gone, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to do too much of a diatribe here, but um, maybe I already did. Um, but... You know, when, when you say the anti-vax movement, I mean, how does that kind of fit in? Again, I know you're not trying to be medical per se, but but where do you try to draw the line uh, on your own societal messaging? Mm -hmm. Well, when I say anti-vax, I use that term loosely because that's just what you're labeled. I mean, you would be called anti-vax regardless, just because, True. you know. Um, and so, you know, I just I, I use that term with a grain of salt. Um you know, personally in my life, uh, we have stopped with our kids. My my oldest son um, was injured with his early childhood shots. That's been confirmed by our family doctor, and, and he's correlated all that. And uh, and my wife went down that rabbit hole a long time ago. The thing we're at, where we're at now, as a society, like when you talk about the amount of shots that were given back in the '80s versus where we're at now. When does that stop? How much further are we going? There's a system in place now. They're not. It's not like we we've reached the pinnacle with the the COVID shot. Is it? We're done. There's enough shots. That's going to keep happening as long as big pharma can do that. And so, you know, from my perspective, uh, it it you know we it's time to stop and take a look at all these with a, a little fine tooth comb and really take an honest, sincere look at it and 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 really decide what it is, figure out what it is that these are, there's there's a lot of questions around it, right? The, the link to autism and things like that, that people, there's a big debate, 
nothing's really coming to a, 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 conclu a conclusive thing, right? I'm, mm -hmm. And so I think that we're on a bad trajectory is all I'm saying, is that if we're up to 200, over 200 shots now, and in another 40 years, are we going to be up to 400? You know, is our life, when does it stop? And that's, you know, kind of where my messaging is to just get people to think outside of the, outside of this trajectory that we're on. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you there. I, I, I think, you know, Andrew Wakefield uh, is a physician. He's uh, probably in his 70s now. He was in England. And, and he basically uh, was kind of an upper class guy. I think he's son of physicians, uh, well educated and uh, MD and doing the whole life as a doctor. And he um, was way back when, I think in the 80s as well, um, he said he was worried about the, a lot of the combination vaccines, the DPT, the MMR, all that kind of stuff. He said, you know, we can't really tell if there are problems, which one it is. We should try to work out a schedule where we can make comparisons and separate these out and see which ones are useful, which ones are society. Anyway, he, he wasn't anti-vax per se, uh, but he was, um, you know, using the term loosely, he was crucified over this. Um, and he, uh, you know, he was sent into medical exile. I don't think he's allowed to practice. And, it, you know, it, it, mentioning his name um, is it, kind of like grounds for dismissal on, on all the, you know, um, you know, social media channels and whatnot. And, uh, but I think he's been somewhat, I think his base, if you actually listen to him, um, his base theory is scientific. You know, it's like the essence of science is is, is investigation and and weighing and and continually doing that. And and we just have a lot of things coming down the pike, um, which are not all essential. And I think the COVID, you know, COVID vaccine for children is is a very you know easy way as a, a litmus test or you know divining rod or whatever you want to see you know to to figure out where people are. I, I was speaking with a pediatrician friend of mine. Uh, literally just a few days ago, and I I um, I asked him, you know, are you giving coronavirus vaccines to kids now? He said, yes, of course. <laughs> and uh, what? Why? Why? He says, well, blah blah blah. You know that this whatever it's recommended. And um, do you think the kids would get sick from COVID to any great extent without your giving them a vaccine? He says, no. I said, well, why are you giving them? And he kind of had to think for a little bit because I don't think anybody challenged him within medicine or his practice. And he said, well, long, you know, long COVID. Now, long COVID itself is a debatable item, you know, whether it's an actual syndrome or not. And as such as it does occur, is probably, you know, one of these, uh, you know, kind of fibromyalgia, you know, chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, something that such as we've always had amongst our middle-aged, you know, population, you know, who was on the sad side of the equation a little bit. But kids don't have long COVID from what my understanding. And the syndrome itself is not really a full syndrome. And, and I said, well, I don't think really kids get that. You know, do they, could you, can you tell me how many kids get long COVID? Well, he kind of switched long. He said, well, really it's the social contract. The social contract is, you know, a, a very vague thing. It's from kind of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And the, the concept is kind of on the left side of things, on the more kind of communist side of things, which is that you do things to be part of, you know, society, help society. And I think this is an abrogation of the, the physician-patient relationship, you know, which is one-on-one. -on -one. I'm supposed to treat you. You come in for my problem. You have a boil on your finger. I'm not going to say, you know, I, I think, you know, people have too many fingers. I'm willing to sacrifice your finger for the greater good. You know, my obligation is to treat your boil and and, and whatever. And, and, you know, the, the social contract is, is I think, a kind of a mislaid um, piece of, of, of action that, that is ignoring the fact that kids don't need to take the coronavirus vaccine. And the WHO itself came out saying that, you know, in, that, that, that kids shouldn't a year ago. And anyway, it's just kind of, I, I think physicians have kind of moved away from uh, the reality of, of their trust with patients. And I'm going to end this diatribe quickly. But, you know, the, the, you know, I think that puts into, you know, the way they've kind of gone on to open another can of worms here, they've gone on with, you know, this gender um, stuff where, where kids, um, are being, you know, sexually altered, you know, forever, um, before, you know, the age that they could, you know, willingly get a tattoo, uh, or drink a can of beer or whatever, um, mm -hmm. is, is putting, a, a, you know, kind of a weird, harsh light on the medical profession and all of these health giving, uh, caring professions as to whom they are actually treating and whom they're working for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, 
you know, that has a lot to do with the the public's trust issues with the healthcare system right now is people are waking up to the idea that a lot of it, it you know the protocols in place for why things are being done to you are just because the you know that medical professional was told to or or some you know they don't really know they're waking up to the fact that they don't really know why they're doing what they're doing right when you say well, why are you giving it to kids and he doesn't know that's that's alarming right you don't really understand why he's doing what he's doing and I, you know honestly i just think it all has to do with money I, and um you know with the trans kid movement that's a that's a a lifetime of shots and meds and surgeries and that you know if you get your doctor who supports you in, in doing that you're going to keep going back and you're going to keep writing that check and it's the same thing with the COVID shot in, in contracts, you know, with big pharma is it, it's, you know, people forget this all originally started with, we just need to get the elderly vaccinated. That's, you know, we just need, you know, and then, and then it, it worked its way down, you know, age by age. Now we got, and, and the kids at the beginning, at that same point, they were never going to be at risk of, of getting sick ever. But now, for some reason, it's worked its way into uh, the childhood shot schedule um, for no reason other than, you know, somewhere behind the scenes. Somebody said, well, we got that market covered. Let's get the next one. Let's get the yeah. next one. Hey, if we can get this in everybody every year, that's an ongoing contract. I think I think you should probably as a business model, see if you can get your um, records or songs into the, uh, you know, if, if you could somehow get the same sinecure, you know, this kind of rent seeking, uh, you know, regulatory capture that mm -hmm. vaccine manufacturers have had. so that foist upon people uh, without their real knowledge or whatever. If you could do that as a, as a music uh, play, you know, yeah. so only it's listen a subscription to the plan. You, yeah. you get, you get the verse first of the song. And if you subscribe, I'll, I'll send you the chorus and, uh, <laughs> It all has to so, work together. So on, on a lighter note, uh, I had this this idea that that you know I don't know where it came to me one morning. I think uh, I said, you know what? I think Taylor Swift is 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 uh, is uh, is girls Bruce Springsteen. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Tell, tell me. What yeah, you think I think that she's. I think she's becoming the modern Michael Jackson figure. You know, the bigger than life um, superstar. Um, you know, Bruce Springsteen, who is another letdown who did vaccine only vaccinated only concerts and stuff. Um, oh, he did. I didn't. I don't know. Oh yeah. Yeah. He, he, um, yeah. Uh, he did vaccinated only. And then he, then he wouldn't, then he did vaccinated only concerts. But if you had the AstraZeneca shot, you weren't allowed in. I think what it was, <laughs> you got very specific with it, you know, and you hear guys like Springsteen and you're just like, what are you doing? You know? Um, but I look at Taylor Swift, like a Michael Jackson type figure, you know, it's, it's, it's pop music. Kids love it. You can put her on a t-shirt and, um, she's larger than life. She's filling in stadiums in that way. She's young. Um, it's, it's, it's not just a concert. Um, it's an experience. It's a, it's a show, you know, it's a, it's a big event. And, you know, circling back around to that, I think, you know, that's great if you enjoy the songs, but if you don't like what she's, how she's convincing culture, you need to stop giving her money. You know, I posted that a few weeks ago on, on X. I was like, stop giving Taylor Swift your money. You know, that's the idea is that, you know, your little girl is going to be like, I want to go see Taylor Swift. I, I need to see Taylor Swift's concert. All my friends are going to see Taylor Swift. Can we go, you know, and, and, and then the parent gives in and gives Taylor Swift another $500 for a couple tickets or whatever it may be. And you have a stadium of, you know, of, of families that are going, um, she's, you know, she's the richest pop star on earth right now, but she has, a lot of power in her hands and if you don't like what she's doing with that power you need to stop funding that power and we need to do that culturally um across the board not just with her but you know 
look at sports. How many times have people sworn off sports because the players kneeled or something or made some political statement? Um, or the ho you know, hockey teams are now wrapping their sticks with rainbow tape for pride nights and things like that. If you don't agree with that, then you need to stop funding it and send that message. Otherwise, you've, you've stopped nothing. And that's part of, you know, that's part of my mission. And, I, and I've seen that that happen with with my own music is when when my Silent War album came out, it was on the best sellers on Amazon sitting next, actually, right, right in between Taylor Swift and Bruce Springsteen. And so for an artist like me who recorded an album in my bedroom uh, and, and, and put zero dollars into funding it to see the power of what our movement can do when you actually vote for with your dollars, what society can do when you vote for your morals and convictions with your dollars to get an artist like that up there with the, that level of the machine of Taylor Swift, Bruce Springsteen, uh, living legends, so to speak. Um, we can do that uh, and, and really change culture. Uh, not just with me, but we you know, like I mentioned, Tom McDonald, he was topping, iTunes charts last week with that Ben Shapiro song and uh, Bryson Gray is another artist that's done it. Um, and, uh, you know, I know all these guys, they're doing incredible things. So it's a time to do that, to, to, to really vote with your dollars, but also not give in to, to the things that you're accustomed to doing. Disney's another platform, you know, nobody likes the trajectory Disney's on and they continue proving to their core their former core audience that they do not care about them, which was families. So it's a strange thing. I mean, when I grew up a uh, thousand years ago, you know, Sunday night, we'd be at friends' houses or whatever. And, you know, there was the wide world of Disney or whatever it's called. And, you know, you just watch it. There'd be stories and, you know, it was wholesome family fair. Um, mm. it, it just seems so strange that, that these companies put all their chips on transgression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's another thing where we don't even understand the magnitude of what's happening behind the scenes because I think there are a lot of deals being made to push certain agendas that it doesn't matter if they're losing money, if they're hemorrhaging as a company, or it, it just doesn't matter because behind the scenes, it's, it's, a, it's a long game that's being played, right? If, they, if they're hurting now, but they can punch the agenda through, even though it's being rejected. Eventually, society will, you know, accept it as normal if they just get through one generation. Right? Yeah. All, all they need is a couple generations to fall by, you know, to die off, and yeah, then. I mean, I think it's, I think it's ultimately, you know, a short-sighted thing because societies, you know, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here in a, uh, in a structure um, that has presumably some girding. Um, you know, I assume there are wood beams and maybe steel, whatever, holding me up. Um, but, you know, if termites uh, get to enough of it, um, then I could be sitting here one day and then not the next. Um, I think, you know, pe th these kind of, you know, this kind of attack of the basic nuclear family, um, it's kind of a nuclear attack at society itself because, you know, the, the, it, everything kind of go, emanates outward like ripples from an attacked family. Um, your values, your morals, your guidance, your strength, your ability to carry on independently. So, so a lot of the you know things that accrued, you know, the smartphones and um, you know supersonic jets and uh, you know vehicles and computers so that those emanate from a society that has a reasonable level of intact um, thinking and and rule of law and so forth. And and as you keep kind of nibbling away at the margins and so forth, um, you're going to you know wind up with Sam Smith. Um, you know, running things, and and that doesn't have, you know there haven't I, from my understanding there haven't been any successful Satanist societies, you know, and even societies that that don't follow kind of the, um, you know, say the the pathway of, of Christian European nations, uh, those those have not been successful overall. They have not produced you know this uh, you know good fraction you know, 40, 50 percent of the pop of the world population. 40% is Islamic and there are a fair number of Islamic states, but you'd be hard pressed to find any inventions that, that emanated from them since algebra. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the method by which you have a successful society, I think is, um, you know, is, is going ultimately to be eroded 
and the building will collapse. There are a lot, plenty of trees in my neighborhood that look like trees one day, and then they've fallen, you know, some little mini, mini storm, and you've seen the inside has been rotted out, and, mm -hmm. and you know, termites or whatever have had at it. And there's a fair amount of termitization that's happening societally um, that people think they can just keep getting away with one more thing, and they can until, you know, change analogies, until the Jenga pile uh, falls down, until the tree falls, till the house falls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great analogy. I mean, it's it's very much an infestation of what's happened to society and it's not it's not like it's 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 not rocket science if you look at how over the last i don't know just say 60 years how we've continuously inch by inch left god behind left fam the 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 nuclear family behind it's not getting any better and so it's only going to continue to go down that road until you know, if, if, if it doesn't change, there's there's no upside to a society that's filled with um, Satan worshipers and, and boys walking around with, you know, fake parts and girls walking around. With, you can't procreate from there. It doesn't work no, like that. Kind of so, no, it's yeah. a funny, funny thing. Um, I, anyway, we're kind of rounding out the hour here, and I don't want to keep you forever. <laughs> I'd love to, but... Um, so I want to be able to show people where they can find you. Uh, maybe some closing words for uh, our audience and um, the world at, at, in, in general. Yeah, I mean, I'll, you know, just keep doing everything that we've been talking about here. You know, I think if you're speaking out, great. You know, I, I always try to, you know, encourage anybody, find, find out what it is that you have to offer this moment in time. Um, and and do it. Stand up now. There's a lot at stake for our future, for our kids' future, um, for the country, the world at large. I mean, find out what it is that you and, and risk it all. Because if we don't do, you know, what we can do right now, um, there won't be anything to risk in the future. Um, but vote with your dollars. You know, start finding out who it is in your community that that is like minded and um connect with them and get back to that but um yeah and and finding me online five times august saw the website pulled up there um five times august.com you can check out the music and and uh you know support the work i've got cds and, and vinyl and shirts available and and then my following me on x is where i'm the most loud mouthed <laughs> get myself into trouble um but um yeah, it's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much. I apologize for my diatribes, um, but uh, until I get self-medicate more, I'm going <laughs> to uh, keep doing those. Um, and uh, so just as a last, last, last word, uh, if people want to help support my uh, podcast, this is a completely unrelated topic, uh, but it's um, you can buy my book. Even better if you read it, um, but at least buy it. Uh, Overturning Zika, the pandemic that never was. I think there's a lot of uh, similar themes, kind of medical overreach, and people make all these assumptions that medicine is all these things that it may not be. This is an actually amazing case example. It's not that long ago. It's 2015, 2016. and never recurred, but nobody's nobody's retracted the theory that, that uh, Zika, which is a real uh, but minor dengue virus, um, caused microcephaly when, my, when, when dengue itself never did. And... Uh, um, and they went with this when there were no measurements, prior year measurements of microcephaly, there were no Zika tests. And everyone thinks that the science was there, but the science is, I mean, science, like any of these things, it's all a bunch of people. And it's a lot of times what people agreed to, uh, you know, it may or may not be that Miley Cyrus has the best song. And I actually like Miley Cyrus, but, but people agree that that is the best song of the year. Now, is it objectively, who knows, you know, was WAP the best song of the year? Who knows? Anyway, with Zika microcephaly, science has kind of voted that this is a real thing. But in fact, it may not be the best song of that year. It may not have mm -hmm. even really been a song. And so I think it's an incredibly instructive uh, lesson. And I wish people had had it um, before COVID. Uh, I had an article out in 2019, but it you know, was a you know, minor blip in the, 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 the uh, radar of all things happening. But, but had people seen what, uh, you know, kind of the hijinks and, and, you know, craziness that happened in the formation of this theory of Zika causing microcephaly, which, mind you, has never recurred anywhere on Earth, even in Brazil, in any of the years, 2017, 
18, 19, even probably 2016 itself never occurred. It was just a panic, uh, you know, kind of crazy uh, panic uh, pandemic in a sense. And we probably would have uh, been a little more sensible about averting some of the issues uh, with the next one. Uh, I can't remember the name. Sorry with a C. Anyway, um, there we have it. Uh, thank you so much, Brad, for being with us. Um, I'm honored uh, to have you on the show, and um, I hope to have you again soon. So people can find you at fivetimesaugust.com. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. And um, I'm going to uh, ship out and, and buy some of your stuff as uh, we speak <laughs> and as we end this. Uh, thanks.